All right, guys, how's it going? Let me start this video with an explanation or two. Things have been a little bit slow recently. I really kind of burned myself out on the rising stuff where I was doing far too many videos, some really big, long videos, and quite often more than two per week. But that was too much. I got a little bit burnt out and I had a vacation last week just to kind of recharge my batteries a bit. So that's one reason why I don't have a Skylake X review. The other reason why I don't have a Skylake X review is that Intel wouldn't send me a Skylake X CPU anyway. And in fact, they don't even answer my emails, so I can't even get any information from them before release. I don't get my hands on any NDA material. I basically need to keep my ear to the ground to figure out when something's coming. Now, you may be thinking, Jim, with videos like you're beating Intel and others like it's been a bad week at Intel, it's not really surprising. But in actual fact, it was a year ago when Intel started to ignore me. If you just type in Broadwell E into your YouTube search box, chances are you'll see one of my videos. Here we go. Broadwell E, Intel's latest and greatest CPU. This is one year ago when I first contacted Intel to ask them for information on Broadwell E. I finally got through to their outsourced PR here in Sweden and everything was very amicable. They even offered me parts. I didn't ask for any CPUs or anything like that. I simply wanted the NDA materials. I was chatting away to their PR and they tried to get hold of CPUs for me. And I said, look, I'm not really bothered about the CPU. I just really want the information so I can get the video done. So I made what I thought was a very fair video, having a look at the architecture and stuff like that. And by all means, check that out and see what you think of it. Mostly to figure out what it was in that video that made Intel start ignoring me. In the end, I don't need Intel. This 27,000 views is completely dwarfed by the 100,000 plus views I'm getting for these other videos on Intel. And you'll be seeing more like this in future. Now, with that said, when it comes to reviewing products, the products have to stand on their own merit. Rather than mess things up with the politics, the product does have to stand on its own, and that is the way I would treat every single review, regardless of the company behind it. So let's move on from that. Before we move on to the reviews, let's take a look at the major changes in the Skylake X architecture. The first major change comes in core-to-core -core communication. For the past eight years, Intel has been using what they called a ring bus, as we can see here in pink in this diagram of a Broadwell E 10 core CPU. So let's say core one is at the top left and that requires information in the level three cache of core five down at the bottom left. Accessing that information would require four hops as the information is moved from core five to core one. But had the information been in core two, just below core one, then clearly it would only take one hop. So the further the information is from the requesting core, the longer it takes to get there, the higher the latency is. Now the ring bus is bi-directional. So say for example, core three requires information from core one's L3 cache, rather than taking the same clockwise trip all the way around the ring bus, it would only require two hops backwards as it were. So this works out pretty well actually, and Intel's been using this for around eight years since their Nehalem X server architecture. Now, as I said, the further away the cores are, the longer the latency. So it's easy to imagine that with more cores comes more latency. And Intel has had server Xeon processors with up to 24 cores. And what they've done here is basically split the cores into two, 12 on the left, 12 on the right with a ring bus in each. This is still one CPU, but it's effectively been split in two using the ring buses and a switch in the middle, which again, by the arrows we can see is bidirectional. So if core one wanted the information held in say core 20, the information would travel from core 20 through the switch and along to core one. The switch does add additional latency, but in most cases, this would be a better method of doing it rather than having one much larger ring bus. But times change and core counts continue to rise and Intel really needed a new method of core to core communication. So they've developed what is really a very elegant method, which is a mesh topology and allows for much faster steps and much faster communication, especially with cores that are further apart. The information from any cache can now travel in any direction to any other core through any connecting cores. It's very elegant and to me looks like the smart way of doing this. In my You're Beaten Intel video, I showed a die shot of what I believed was a 20 core Skylake X CPU. I wasn't convinced about that being 20 cores because two of them clearly looked much different. It turns out that these are in fact DDR4 memory controllers, which of course are also connected to the mesh. So this is in fact an 18 core CPU with two DDR4 memory controllers. I would have thought that a central placement of these memory controllers would have made more sense, but there's obviously another reason for not doing that. 
Intel's new mesh architecture should be a reduction in latency and an increase in bandwidth. The second change in the Skylake X architecture, and probably the biggest change to the architecture Intel has made in many years, was their rebalancing of the cache hierarchy. I talk a little bit about cache in my Zen AMD's new CP architecture video, which I will leave a link to in the description, so check that out if you want more information. What Intel has done is, they have basically kept the level 1 cache the same. It's the same in Skylake X as it was in the previous X series CPUs, for example Broadwell E, but they have quadrupled the level 2 cache, up from 256 kilobytes to 1 megabyte. So that's a massive change and should really help with loads which are sensitive to larger level 2. A larger cache can of course mean higher latency, but it's not a huge issue here. The biggest issue here could come from the much smaller L3, down from the 2.5 megabyte per core of a CPU like the 6950X to only 1.375 megabytes per core on the new 7900X. So that's just slightly over half the size. Intel believes that the high hit rate on the low latency mid-level cache, that is your L2, should increase performance, and it will, in those loads that are L2 sensitive. However, those loads that are L3 sensitive are likely to see a reduction in performance. The L3 has also become a victim cache, which is similar to AMD's Ryzen CPUs. Victim caches are more limited in capability, and in Intel's case, they have also increased the latency. So for those loads that do depend on L3, that could end up as something of a double whammy to performance. Why have they done this? Simply put, that larger L2 looks like it will be more useful in servers, while being quite a bit less useful in the consumer desktop market, or at least when it comes to gaming. But we'll see how that worked out when we look at the benchmarks. Right now, like I said, I don't have any Skylake X processors myself, so instead of doing that, I'll be taking a look at a selection of reviews across the web. And as usual, I'm going to start at Anantech. The Anantech review is highly technical. Getting more technical, I would say, ever since Ian Cutris started doing the CPU reviews. And he has clearly put a lot of work into this. Now, Anantech were one of the few websites that got all three Skylake X processors. So starting at the top, you've got the i9-7900X, 10 cores, 20 threads, with a 3.3 GHz base clock, 4.3 GHz turbo clock, and 4.5 GHz turbo max clock. So that's a one core turbo. Again, we can see the L3 is way down, 44 PCIe lanes, and of course quad channel. Priced at $1,000, 140 watts TDP. We'll be seeing more about that later though. The next one down is the i7-7820X, 8 cores, 16 threads, 3.6 GHz base, 4.3 turbo, and again 4.5 turbo max. Only 11 MB of cache, and again quad channel memory, the same 140 watts. At $600, this looks like it should be pretty good competition for AMD's R7-1800X. Just looking at these stats, the 7820X should be faster in almost all cases. And finally we have the i7-7800X. 6 cores, 12 threads, 3.5 GHz base, 4 GHz turbo, and no turbo max clock in this one. Again, even less L3, because it has less cores, and only 28 PCIe lanes, the same as the 7820X, which I forgot to mention. This sort of segmentation really annoys me about Intel, the way they always try to upsell you to the next CPU. Effectively, what this means is, if you want to make full use of two graphics cards, you now need to spend $1,000 to get that. Now, Anantech also has some nice comparisons between other CPUs, for example, the 7900X and the 6950X. With the much higher clock speeds, the 7900X should easily defeat the 6950X. So onto the benchmarks. One interesting benchmark you won't see elsewhere is Ian's own self-penned benchmark, 3D particle movement. And with this one, we see a pretty big win for the i9-7900X, which is a good deal ahead of the 6950X, which is only slightly ahead of the Ryzen 7 1800X, which does actually beat the i7-7820X. I'm going to be saying X an awful lot in this. So this benchmark does look like it maybe slightly favours AMD's architecture, just a little bit. But when we move on to the next benchmark, we see something pretty interesting. Digicortex 1.2. The 6950X and even the 8 core 16 thread 6900K is faster than the new 10 core i9-7900X. Now this is clearly a multi-threaded benchmark because it's all the multi-threaded CPUs at the top. The problem here is the new Skylakes are simply underperforming. And again we can see the 7820X here is actually quite a bit below 
even the Ryzen 7 1700X, with a 6-core Skylake X CPU well and truly beaten by AMD's competition, the Ryzen 5. What is all this about? You've got a good multi-threaded win followed by a bad multi-threaded loss. What we're seeing here is likely to be down to the differences in the cache and the lack of L3 is immediately showing up as a potential issue. Every so often there is a case where the i9-7900X looks absolutely monstrous. And here is one case of that. Corona, which is a benchmark I use myself, sees a win of 33% for the i9 over the older i7-6950X. Even the 8-core Skylake X beats the old 10-core just by a little. And those three are followed by a couple of Ryzen 7 CPUs. When it all comes together like this for the i9, it looks like an absolute monster of a CPU, as you would expect. With 10 highly clocked cores and that large L2, every so often you're going to see massive, massive wins. But every so often things just kind of fall apart. Moving on to Sun Spider, and the 7900X is well behind, but it's well behind a selection of CPUs. You've got the very fast quad core KB Lake X's, you've got Zen in there, the Ryzen 5 is right up there, but you've also got the previous generation Broadwell E's, all ahead of the new 7900X. Google Octane, 7900X once again coming in below the Ryzen 5 and the 6950X, and again on Web Expert, the 7900X is well behind the Ryzen 5. Moving on to some office tests, PC Mark. 8 and once again the 6950X and a couple of Ryzen CPUs are all ahead of the 7900X. One more part worth checking out about Ian's review was comparing Skylake S and Skylake X performance clock for clock. So an IPC comparison, so that's your i5-6600 and your i9-7900X, both with 4 cores and no hyper-threading at 3 GHz, and of course no turbo. The overall result was only half a percent gain in IPC, which is within the margin of error. So in IPC terms, there's no great gains. This is all about bigger cores, faster clock speeds. If you're at all interested in Skylake X, you probably want to read Anantech's whole review. Now moving on to PC Perspective, who only had an i9, 7900X and some pretty eye-opening gaming benchmarks at 1080p, of course. Now we can see the i9 is in red, with the 10-core Broadwell i7 in blue, the 7700K in green, and they've also thrown in a Ryzen 7 1800X in purple. The eye-opening part being, the 7900X is never faster than the 6950X. All those games, all that clock speed, and not a single win. Worse still than that though, there are some pretty hefty losses. Civilization 6 shows a thumping lead for the 10-core Broadwell E, and again a big lead in Far Cry Primal, and a bit less of a lead in Hitman. Now to be fair, it's all pretty close in some cases, and it should also be pointed out that the i9 is still faster than the 1800X in 7 out of the 8 tested games. But again, this shows a weakness which will require optimization. Whether or not we see that optimization, I'll talk about that at the end. Now PC Perspective also did some overclocking, and they were able to get 4.6 GHz on all 10 cores, and the system running mostly stable. I'm not entirely convinced by that. Mostly stable? Tells me that it wasn't stable. However, temperatures at this point would spike to over 100 degrees Celsius. And this isn't the stock cooler, this is a Corsair H100i GTX water cooler. Something I want to point out about PC Perspectives review, you know I'm always looking for one or two oddities. I noticed they're running the 7-zip compression benchmark and only as far as 8 threads. Now I benchmarked 7-zip in my Ryzen 7 review and I pointed out the difference between compressing and decompressing using 7-zip. Ryzen is extremely good when it comes to decompressing and not quite so good at compressing, but that's actually a very good trade-off. Because if you think about it, how often do you compress an archive? How often do you zip files in 7-zip? compared to how often do you unzip files, my reckoning would be the vast majority of you spend a lot more time decompressing or unzipping archives. So you would think that decompression is much more important, yet PC Perspective is using the 7-zip compression instead. So I thought that was a little bit kind of strange. It doesn't make any sense. And they're also only scaling to 8 threads. Now you can specify the number of CPU threads. If you just take a look at these numbers after 3 passes, this is with 16 threads on an 1800X. So you're around 29,000 million instructions per second, that's for compression, and around 45,500 for decompressing. So if you now switch to 8 CPU threads, and now we can see the 1800X is around 24,000 for compression and just under 26,000 for decompression. That's a massive drop in decompression. 
PC perspective can benchmark whatever they like. I'm just pointing out that this makes absolutely zero sense. If you're running 7-zip, you're not switching off half of your CPU threads. The benchmark shows 1, 2, 4 and 8 threads, which really just serves to make lower core count CPUs perform better. Now with that said, the 7900X performs extremely well in this, in compression, and I'm pretty sure it would perform even better with 16 threads while still being well ahead in the decompression benchmarks as well. I thought this was worth looking into further, so I took a look back at their 7700K review at the beginning of January, and this was when PC Perspective decided to replace WinRAR with 7-zip. We can see here that they're only running 8 threads again, so this was when they first started, and this is probably why they've only gone with 8 threads. If they've started benchmarking the 7700K, you're basically stuck with 8 threads, and you wouldn't notice that the higher thread count CPUs could run the benchmark with higher thread counts. Also interesting was when I checked the Ryzen 7 review. So this is back in March, right at the beginning of the Ryzen release, and we can see the 1800X scores 30,371. That's with 8 threads. And fast forward to the Skylake X review, and it still scores the same, and in fact they all do. So in other words, they're recycling numbers here as well. I've done enough benchmarking to know that rebenching is an absolute chore, but using the older numbers with all the BIOS issues and all that stuff, it's not really showing performance reflective of what we see today. Again, I don't want to be too hard on PC Perspective or any of these guys because I know just how difficult this is and also how time consuming and boring it is. And I certainly don't believe that all these publications should rebench with every new CPU that is released. However, with every new CPU architecture that is released, rebenching all the previous architectures really should be done. And the next i9-7900X review over at Tom's Hardware pretty much shows why this should be the case. I've decided to cut down the length of some of these videos though, trying to keep videos below 20 minutes from now on. I've said this in the past and I failed to do it, but had I not split this one, it would probably have been over 30 minutes of video. So you're going to have to wait until tomorrow to see the second part of this, where I do a roundup of Tom's hardware and one or two other reviews before I form my conclusion of the new Skylake X CPUs. So look out for that one tomorrow. I'll catch you later guys.